All right, hopefully you have uh, got the notes that I sent you. And a second way of providing hope. The first way, last week we talked about what? The attributes of God. And I hope maybe you considered some of the case studies that were presented to you and kind of uh, figured out what attribute. And there could have been several ap attributes that you could have used. Uh, there's not a right or wrong answer per se. It's just something that you could have practiced. Uh, today, we want to talk about using the names of God. But before we do that, I want to look at the significance and guidelines for using the names of God. Uh, let me preface uh, our conversation this way. Unlike most human beings who have three names, you have a first name, a middle name, and a last name. God has many names he uses to communicate with his creation. And in this significance and guidelines that we're going to go through here in a few minutes will help us understand how to use the names of God with people who are discouraged. So let's begin with this. The first three names in your chart, if you're taking a look at your chart, the first three names, Yahweh, Elohim, and Adonai, the first three names are singular names. It's not a compound name. Um, the next three names are a compound beginning with L, and that signifies, in the Hebrew, that signifies uh, God. And then the, the compound is what is known in English, I believe, as an uh, apposition, something that describes. So when you take a look at El Shaddai, is God and then what Shaddai means. It clarifies an attribute. It clarifies a nature, uh, a personage of God. You will notice that there are seven compound names beginning with Jehovah. Um, Jehovah means God, but again, the apposition, the word that is coupled with Jehovah, will give a specific feature uh, about the Hebrew God. And the Hebrews would understand this very, very, very much so. Uh, it became very significant to them. And the thing that you should also notice is most of the Jehovah compounds are only used once, are only used once, and it's given to a specific person that communicates a specific activity of God in their situation. Now, the word Yahweh is used 800 times. I thought that would be more, but Elohim is the one that is used the most, 2,500 times. You have Adnaya at 450 times, and then El Elyon 28 times. So Yahweh 800 times, Elohim 2,500, Adonai 450, El Elyon 28 times. Now, the compound name of Jehovah cannot necessarily be traced as far as the frequency, as I mentioned before. Generally, it's probably just one time that I have been able to discover, but it communicates an aspect of God's nature, character, or person in a meaningful situation to the hearer, to the person who received the name of God. So with that in mind, let's begin to fill in the chart. First one is Yahweh. That name means eternal, self-existent, no beginning, no end. Yahweh is always there, has always been. Then you have Elohim. That means mighty, 
a strong, powerful Elohim. And then Adonai means Lord, majesty, sovereignty, a person who is in control and worthy of worship. El Shaddai, Almighty God. Shaddai carrying the concept of might or power. El Shaddai, Almighty God. And then El Elyon is God Most High. God Most High. Do I still need to leave that up? Or are you guys okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I can go back or I can send this to you. El Olam. That means everlasting God. Everlasting God. Now, if you had a favorite name of God... Mine would be the Jehovah Compounds because there is specific biblical references to them. For example, Jehovah Jireh, that simply means the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. Now, when did God reveal this name and to whom and what were the circumstances? Genesis 22. The name was given to Abraham, and you remember the story in Genesis 22, the record there recorded by the Spirit of God, that God told Abraham, get up in the morning and take Isaac and go to a mountain that I'm going to show you. And so Abraham complied fully uh, with a potential sacrifice. And when Isaac says, where is the lamb? Then Abraham said, the Lord will provide. And that's where that name comes from. Now, if you push the envelope a little bit here, and Romans verifies this, I believe, or maybe it's Hebrews. You push the em envelopes a little bit uh, on this name, Jehovah Jireh. Uh, God would never have expected Abraham to sacrifice his son. Human sacrifices was an abomination to God. The Canaanites did it. All of the other ites did it. God was testing Abraham. In effect, if you read the, the uh, account correctly, God says that he was going to test Abraham. And the purpose of the test is that Abraham started to love the gift more than the giver. <clears throat> and at the end of this test, God says, oh, now I know that you love me. So Abraham's love was called into question. Uh, he had the promised child, uh, Isaac, and his affection <laughs> was starting to wane away from God. <laughs> So it's a very, very special name to Abraham. The Lord will provide. How can you use this in counseling? Provided that there's not a sinful situation, I believe we can encourage those who are discouraged. They are wondering about what's going to take place in the future, say with the coronavirus. They're already talking about how we should be act after we get the shots. What things can we do? What things can't we do? And all of this conjecture on their part. And there has been some real financial hurt by people and especially small business owners. Many of them have had to close up shop. Well, the Lord will provide. If our allegiance and love and adoration is for Lord is for the Lord, and we don't have an idol in our heart, 
he's going to provide for us. Now, how he provides, when he provides, is up to God. We cannot put stipulations on God. We cannot repeat the mistake that Elijah did when he went down into the city and expected God to clean up the city like he did on Mount Carmel. Jehovah Ra, Rapha, the Lord who heals, the Lord who heals. And this was given to the children of Israel that had just come out of Egypt in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. They had just got done watching the Egyptians get baptized, if you please, as the Red Sea came back in upon them as they tried to pursue Israel and take them back into slavery. God closed up the walls of water upon them. They stood up and saw the Egyptians and the chariots and the horses floating in the water. God had taken care of them. And so Miriam sings a song of praise for God's deliverance. And God tells the children of Israel that I will not bring upon you the plagues that I did on the Egyptians, provided that you obey me. The Lord who heals, and for them at that particular point, there was a tremendous amount of healing in their life compared to the life of uh, abuse, a life of slavery, a life of hurt and harm and death and illness that they experienced in Egypt. The Lord will heal. Now, hang on for a minute, lest we get into a theology that is not biblically supported. The Lord will heal whoever he wants to heal, whenever he wants to heal, and however he wants to heal. There is nothing in Scripture, when taken in context, where anybody can claim, name it and claim it, that so-and-so is going to be healed. We don't know the mind of the Lord in matters of illness. Now, we certainly know our heart that we would want this person to be made better, to be restored, that this person would be able, if they are a believer, to be able to continue on and serve the Lord. That That's, that's human relational emotions, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if the Lord chooses to do something else, we have no grounds to get upset with God because he didn't answer our prayer. He answered his will. That's the important thing here. Now, the name it and claim it crowd looks to Isaiah 53, talking about the Messiah. And they will pull a verse out of context, and they will say, by his stripes, we are healed. Well, look at the context. It's talking about the Messiah. It's talking about his crucifixion. It's not talking about physical healing. It's talking about spiritual healing. And the stripes that he bore was the punishment that God ordained for him to experience for our sin, for the penalty of our sin, has nothing to do with physical healing. I can bring many examples to you, but I do not want to take up the broadcast with that. Just understand, when you use the names of God, and in particular the compound names of God, you understand the context, who it was given to, and what was going on, so you don't misinterpret the application to the person you're trying to help. Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner. The Lord our banner. This is found in Exodus chapter 17, verse 15. And what's going on is they have just come out of Egypt. They have just gone through the Red Sea. Miriam has sung her song. God has given a name 
Jehovah Rapha to them. And now, just two chapters later, they encounter the Amalekites. Now, the Amalekites were not friendly towards this two and a half million pack of Jews, and they decided to wage war against them. Moses commissions Joshua to be the captain of the army and to go out and wage war. I find that a little bit humorous because Moses, under the direction of God, is sending Joshua out with men who were basically bricklayers, maybe a little bit of agricultural down in Egypt. And Moses got on top of a hill and could look down into the valley of the battle. And as long as Moses' hands were held up, you know the story, Israel had victory over the Amalekites. But come on, how 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 much can you and I even hold our hands up? Do you think you can do it for 15 minutes? Hold your hands up for 15 minutes, okay? I don't think I can do that. Uh, I know I can hold my hand on the refrigerator door, but hold them up, I'm not quite sure. Um, and Moses got tired. So they found a rock for him to sit on, and two people held his arms up, and as long as his arms were held up, Joshua had the victory. Now, here's a very important thing about the Lord, mm -hmm. our banner, okay? Why is Moses up on this mountaintop? Why is he up there? Because in a military conquest, even through the colonial days, if you take a look at battle plans and the way they war wage war, the British with the colonists was absolutely a suicide mission, but the commanders set themselves far apart up on a hill to watch the battle and to direct the military activity. So if the Lord is my banner, Moses representing the Lord, Joshua would look to Moses for direction on what to do and how to proceed. The Lord is our banner. Who do we look to for direction and how to proceed when we are involved in a spiritual battle? That's exactly what this word, this name of God means. Then Jehovah Shalom, Judges 6.24. Judges 6.24. And in the book of Judges chapter 6, it's this name was given to Gideon. He was one of the judges that we'll get to later on on Sunday night. And the name was given to Gideon. And in the context, Gideon is really skittish about obeying the Lord because he's going to go directly against his father and his clan. And God tells Gideon, I want you to go and tear down the altar that your father has set up, and I want you to offer a sacrifice on that altar. And Gideon called the place Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. When we are in the middle of God's word, will, when we are doing God's will to the best of our knowledge and according to the scriptures, we can have the peace of God that passes all understanding because he is our peace. Jesus made peace with God at Calvary. And then Jesus is the peace of God to the believer because we have that relationship. Jehovah Ra. The Lord is my shepherd. And of course, you know this in Psalm chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd. But stop for a moment and just ponder that Psalm. Who's writing it? Well, David is writing it. Was David a shepherd? Well, he sure was. Uh, he often was left out to tend the sheep by himself. You know the story of him encountering the bear and the lion. You know that he was a harpist 
and that God used him to calm the evil spirit in Saul, David writes this psalm, and a shepherd is one, as described in Psalm 23, that would lead the sheep to quiet pastures, or green pastures, quiet flowing water. Sheep don't, sheep does, sheep do not want to drink from a roaring fountain or a roaring lake or a roaring river. It has to be calm for them because they're very, very skittish animals. And this is what Jehovah Ra does for the believer. He leads us in green pastures. In other words, there is going to be nourishment. There is going to be sustenance for us. He leads us beside the quiet waters. That is going to be refreshment. That is a place of rest and recuperation. That is what Jehovah Ra entails in part. And you've probably never heard of this one before. Jehovah Tiskanu. Jehovah Tiskanu. This is in Jeremiah 23, verse 6. Jeremiah 23, verse 6. And it means the Lord our righteousness. The Lord our righteousness. Now understand the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a prophet preaching to Israel and to Judah that they are living in sin and there is uh, uh, impending uh, judgment that is coming upon them. They are going to be taken away into captivity. And at the very end of Jeremiah, or or I'm sorry, that's that's the next verse. I'm sorry. In Jeremiah 23, verse 6, he's talking about the coming of the Messiah. And he uses this name for God, the Lord, our righteousness. Now, we've been talking about heaven, right? We've been talking about the new heaven and the new earth, right? And we have gone through the bowls and the seals and the trumpets and the judgments that have taken place. Last week, we talked about all, not all, but many of the world empires that mock God because of their sin. And Righteousness seems to be very askewed, if not absent, from these nations, and especially America. But one day, Jehovah Tiskanu, his righteousness will rule. He will demonstrate that during the millennium of a thousand years. But then he permanently establishes his righteousness in the new Jerusalem. And we will see that next Sunday. And then the last one, Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is our peace. This is in Ezekiel 48, verse 35. Ezekiel 48, verse 35. The Lord, our peace. And again, Ezekiel is one of those prophets who is trying to warn Israel and Judah about the impending captivity that was going to become in place through Nebuchadnezzar uh, and the Babylonians and through the Assyrian Empire. And at the end of his prophetic word, he closes out with Jehovah Shammah, the Lord, our peace. And what an encouragement to the remnant, to the faithful, when they heard these words proclaimed in the midst of their situation, wondering what would be the outcome. And Ezekiel, under the inspiration of God, says, the Lord, our peace, Jehovah Shammah. There will be peace that will come, and it will come through the Lord. Now, there's a caution here I want to show you, okay? When providing hope to the discouraged, you and I need to work hard at showing how one of the names of God would communicate God's presence, power, and purpose for their situation. Just don't throw a name of God at them or an attribute of God at them. That's like throwing a Bible verse out of context into somebody's situation. 
The names of God are significant. They're important. The attributes of God are just as significant and important. And it is imperative that we understand, especially the names of God, the context of that name. And if you're going to use any of the compounds and any of the, Je and in particular the Jehovah compounds, understand the context of that name. Who was that name given to? What was going on? How did it encourage that person receiving that compound name? And that's important for us to keep in mind as we try to help people. Basically, what we're talking about is the names of God are good for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The names of God reflect his immutability. That's a big theological word that simply means God does not change. God does not change. His names and the meaning of his names do not change. The activities of God, his attributes of God do not change. He is always omnipresent. He is always eternal. That is such a wonderful blessing that if we can fathom 5% of the truth that God does not change, boy, would that, would that elevate us to live in greater confidence because in everything in our lives, in our world, changes, God does not change. I don't know whether you've ever heard this or not. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you probably have. Someone will say the only thing that doesn't, the only thing that changes is change. Well, everything changes. Uh, there is a word in science called entropy. Entropy, what does that mean? It means change. Our world is changing. It's not the same as it was yesterday, and it will be different tomorrow. Simply by creation, simply by its proper use of the word now here, evolution, you will not be the same tomorrow as you are today. And you are not the same today as you were yesterday. But God is. And irregardless of circumstances, irregardless of things we do not understand, irregardless of, of events we want to try to control, it doesn't matter. Because if I know God, everything's under his control. Even if I am walking deliberately against God, he doesn't change. Let that one sink in for you. Even if I am walking deliberately away from God, I'm like those men hiding themselves in the cave in Revelation chapter 6, praying that the rocks would cover them so they wouldn't have to deal with the wrath of God. God does not change. God is consistent. He is immutable. So I can trust him. I can trust him just by understanding that he's omnipresent, that he is omnipotent. He is omniscient. I don't know, beloved. I don't know how much you got in your physical bank, but I'll tell you what, in your spiritual bank, if you believe this, you are wealthy beyond compare. Wealthy beyond compare. And no one can steal this away from you. But many Christians don't live in this confidence because they have bartered it away. They have let it slip through their hands. They have deliberately chosen to eat the porridge instead of receive the blessing that God has. So this is tremendous encouragement, beloved. Next week, we'll talk about uh, using 
or, or next week we'll talk about, let me get my notes here, um, directing the counselee to a deeper understanding of God. There are five things that we can share with a person to understand God in a deeper way and what he is doing. 